the church, and, and I'm excited about what the Lord is doing. Um, as we move into the second week of this new Christmas focus, the miracle of Christmas, I thought it would be probably good to uh, share a little bit of, of some of our story of why God brought us to the great state of Tennessee in the first place. And, and by the way, like we've been here 25 years. Are, are we going anywhere? Is this, this is our forever home, I, I think, right? Uh, you know, God sometimes works in mysterious ways, but, but I love Tennessee. And uh, some of you don't know the whole reason that God brought us here 25 years ago was uh, the Lord opened a, a door for me to serve as a part of the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board. And in this job, a big, a big part of what I was asked to do every year was to coordinate um, a big statewide youth conference uh, called YEC. You're like, what in the world is that? Yek, YEC, what is that? That's a terrible name. Well, it's just an acrostic for Youth Evangelism Conference. And uh, man, I could tell you stories for the next three hours about how we saw God move over the years in that. But one of the things that um, we did every single year as churches from all over the state would bring their youth groups to Nashville in March, we always wanted to make sure we had um, someone to do sign language for those that would attend who were hearing impaired. We, we had some churches who had students who, who needed sign language, so we were going to make that happen. We did not want anybody to miss out on any part of the conference. Now, here's my point. If, if you have ever been able to watch someone who is really gifted with, with American Sign Language, someone who is expressive in their sign language, it, like, it is an art. It is absolutely beautiful to, to watch them do what God has gifted them to do. And so you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, not only are they good with the sign language they, they use their hands, but, the, man, their facial expressions for someone who's really gifted. It, it is absolutely amazing to watch them. And so what would happen oftentimes at, at the youth conference, I'd, I'd be down close to the stage and and I would find myself at times, instead of looking at the keynote speaker or the band or whoever's up there doing their thing, I would be just watching the sign language person. And, and man, the joy that, that they shared as they communicated the message of, of God's word and the gospel and, and the music. And I would be like, oh yeah, I forgot. I'm, I'm supposed to be like paying attention to what's happening on the stage right now. Just, just caught up in that moment. You, you know what I'm talking about if you've seen someone that's really, really good at sign language. And, and so in, in maybe in the first two or three years of the conference, back when our kids were still really, really young, toddlers, grade schoolers, I, I remember having this thought like, God, if, if any of my children would have been born hearing impaired, I, I would absolutely want to be able to, to use sign language so that I, as a father, could effectively communicate with my children who I unconditionally loved. I, I would want to do that. I would want to tell them in details how much I love them and how I care for them and how, how I know that God wants the very best for each of them and, and their lives. And so, you know, I'm thinking if I found myself in that situation... Learning sign language, it was not going to be some kind of, you know, burden, but it would absolutely be an expression of love. I think most parents would, would say the exact same thing. Now, here's why, here's why I talk about that. Today, I want you to think about the significance of what our Heavenly Father, God, has done for each of us. Here we are. We're living our lives, doing our thing, kind of pursuing our own agendas most days. And there are times, in fact, maybe more often than not, where I would say we are deaf to God's voice. We, we perhaps don't hear what he is saying to us. Yet we know that God's plan is to communicate his message to each of us. But sometimes, y'all, we just are not getting it. We're not getting it. We're so distracted. 
The most beautiful thing is this, however. Instead of God giving up on you, instead of God giving up on me, he loves us so much. He loves you so much that he reveals himself to you and I in ways that we can understand. You think about exactly what our Heavenly Father did for us. He sends to us His only begotten Son, Jesus, to communicate His message to us in a way we can understand. This, I would say, is the miracle of Christmas And what I want to talk to you about today, this is the the message in the miracle of Christmas. Think about what God's plan is today, right now, Sunday, December 3rd, for your life. His plan is that you, this season, this Advent season, will truly experience the miracle of Jesus. Y'all, we are distracted by so much stuff. So much stuff. You know, last night I mentioned Sean and I getting out and going to buy the stuff for the kid that we adopted. And, you know, we're out there and I'm like, oh, all the pretty lights. Wow, look at this. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling all in the spirit. Well, maybe we could just go down to this store. You know, we do need to get a couple of ornaments for that ornament exchange. We go in to buy two ornaments and walk out the door having spent $99. And then I look up, and there's the discount shoe place, and it's like, oh, honey, hey, what are you, look, buy one, get one, half price. Well, you got to go check that. The world is screaming to us, buy stuff. This, they say that that's the miracle of Christmas, but according to God's perfect will, we're missing it. Why? Because he sends his one and only son, Jesus, to communicate to us the message in a way we can understand. He wants us to experience this miracle of Christmas. And so I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about about the miracle of the actual message. The miracle of the message of Christmas. Look with me, if you would, to the New Testament book of Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. The the subheading over chapter 1 in my Bible says, The nature of the Son of God. Look with me, Hebrews 1, beginning in verse 1. And so, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in many different ways. But in these last days... He has spoken to us. God speaks to us. The Bible says, by his son. And God has appointed him, Jesus, heir of all things, and and he has made the universe through him. So scripture clearly tells us God sent his son, Jesus, to communicate his message in a way that all of us can understand. The miracle of the message is that God speaks to us, here's why, so that you and I can know him, so that you and I can draw near to him, and so that you and I can gather together on days like today and worship that Christ the Savior has been born. Now, you got to take a minute this morning when you talk about this to think about what was just said in that Hebrews text, because you're forced to look backwards. You're forced to look back into the Old Testament. And when we look back into the Old Testament, we will see over and over again how God speaks to us through history. God is always speaking, but he speaks in the Old Testament through the prophets and through history. Throughout history, this is what God has done. He's revealing himself to his people. But again, why, why did he do this in the Old Testament? Because God's desire is that his people would know him, would love him, and worship him. You, you think about some of the ways we see God speaking in the Old Testament. Even in the book of Genesis, God speaks through creation. God speaks to his people through the sunrise and through the sunset. God speaks through the moon and the stars in the sky. You begin to think about some of the significant stories in the Old Testament. God spoke to Moses through what? A burning bush. 
That's not your normal everyday experience. God in the Old Testament spoke to the Israelites in the smoke and the fire on the mountain. God spoke to Elisha in a still, small voice. God spoke to Isaiah in a vision there in the temple. God spoke to Jeremiah through the potter who was sitting there at the potter's wheel as he was working the clay. God spoke to Joseph through dreams. So I, what I want you to see is this. When it comes to God speaking to his people, especially in the Old Testament, there is no lack of variety. All you need to do is get your Bible, open it up, spend some time in God's word, engage in the word, and you will see that God's revelation, God's speaking to his people, speaking to us like it is never boring. It is never going to be monotonous. I promise you that. If you look into the Old Testament, I think you'll also learn this. God rarely speaks in the same place. He rarely does it the same way at the same time. Yet every time he speaks, he is revealing more of himself to us, more of his perfect will to, to all of us. We are his people. Now, when we read the Old Testament, if you study the Old Testament, you read, you see how God speaks to the prophets. But you get to the end of the Old Testament, and there is a gap in the historical line of 400 years when God did not speak. You read the final words of the prophet Malachi, and there were no other prophets who spoke until John the Baptist arrived. So before Jesus... All of those revelations in the Old Testament, they were, they were fragmentary, they were occasional. Yes, all of God speaking in the Old Testament, it all pointed to Jesus. But here's what I want you to see. It did not completely capture the full picture of God's nature to his people. Yes, God has been speaking, but the people were not getting the message. They didn't understand God's heart. They didn't understand God's plan. There were even people who claimed that they could speak on God's behalf, and they just messed that up real good. They, they misrepresented the true nature of God. And so what does that cause? It causes people to struggle, people to be confused, people to not understand about the fullness of God's message. So what is the solution? <laughs> you know what the solution is. God speaks his message to us through his perfect son, Jesus. God speaks through Jesus. He loves you so much that he wanted there to be no confusion. He, he wanted you to have a crystal clear picture of his unconditional love for you. Therefore, he reveals himself to us through his son, Jesus. We read the Bible, we read the New Testament, we read the Gospels. We know that God reveals himself to us through the words spoken by Jesus. But I want you to realize something today. He did more than that. Jesus Christ, God's Son. He is the living, divine Son of God. He did more, Jesus did more than just proclaim God's message Jesus is God's message. If you continue to read in the book of Hebrews, there in chapter 1, jump now to verse 3. Look at this. God's word speaks to this. And so the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory. And look at this. I, I underline this. And Jesus is the exact expression of of his nature. Exactly. Jesus Christ. He is the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact expression 
of the nature of God, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And the Bible says after making purification for sins, after Christ went to the cross, he took on the weight of our sins, he shed his blood at Calvary, he then, he overcame death on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Right there, it's the gospel in Hebrews verses 1 through 2 and 3. What else does the Bible say about this? Some of these texts you will know. You will know that in the Gospel of John, Jesus describes himself as the Word who became flesh. And Scripture says that he now is living among us. Man, people today, we are so distracted. We're looking everywhere for answers. I would simply say this. If you truly want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. You don't understand God. You can't get your mind around it. What does the Bible say to do? Look to Jesus. Do you remember, um, some of you will remember this, when, when Philip, he was asking Jesus, he was confused, just like so many people, and, and he says, Jesus, I, you need to just show us, show us the Father. Look with me, John chapter 14, beginning in verse 8. Here, here's how the conversation plays out. Lord, said Philip, I want you to show us the Father. He's like, here you go. It's never a good idea to kind of make a deal with Jesus. I don't, I don't recommend you do this. Lord, show us the Father, and if you'll just do that, that's all we're going to need. That's going to be enough for us. That's what Philip says. And Jesus says to him, Philip, haven't I been among you all of this time, and you still do not know me, Philip? The one, Jesus says, the one, all you guys here, the ones who have seen me have also seen the Father. How can you say to me, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own, Jesus says. It is the Father who lives in me and does his works. And Jesus says to Philip, believe me, believe me, Philip that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. <laughs> and then Jesus, it's like, I'm just going to go all in with this Philip guy. He says, hey, and if you can't do that, just believe simply because of the works you have seen God accomplish. Believe of the works themselves. In, in the book of John, John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus again says to his followers, I and the Father, he says, we are one. And so today, when you think about this message of Christmas, we know that God speaks his message through history. We have acknowledged, yes, God speaks through his son, Jesus. And the most beautiful thing that you must understand today is that God speaks today. Why? And so that your life can be transformed. Completely transformed by Jesus. Do you realize that this miracle of Christmas, the message of Christmas, the message of our Savior Jesus Christ has the power to transform lives? You'll, you'll hear all the time, you know, the greatest story ever told when we speak of Christmas. It's the greatest message that's ever been proclaimed. Emmanuel, God is now with us. Think about it. God came near to us so that you and I could draw near to him. Paul writes to the church, the New Testament church is struggling to understand this as well. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at what he says. He reminds the church, for there is one God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind and that is the man, Christ Jesus. What did he do? Paul reminds us he is the one, our Savior, who gave himself as a ransom to all his life, a testimony at the proper time. 
last week, uh, we were talking about it's, it's time. It's time. It's time. And in Scripture, we were reminded that God sent His Son, Jesus, in just the right time, a testimony so that all might be redeemed. Why would God do that? Why did God do that? He wants you to know Him. He wants you to have a relationship with Him that, as Henry Blackaby would say, is real and personal. He he wants us to know that He created each of us for a reason, for a purpose, and that reason is simply this, that we might know Him and worship Him and love Him. And so Jesus has come, and he proclaims this message to each of us that you now can be set free through Jesus Christ. You can be set free. I don't know what it is that bogs you down in life. I don't know what it is that you might say, man, I'm in bondage to this sin, but I want you to understand that God sent his son Jesus so that you might never, ever have to live as a prisoner to to guilt, as a prisoner to regrets. And, and for many of you, you may say, Kent, I, I struggle with that. Some of that has to do with the circumstances that have played out in your very own life, even in this past year. If you had been sitting in this worship service one year ago, the first Sunday in December, some of you have experienced things in this past year that you never dreamed you would have to go through. For some of you this past year, oh, you have received a message But some of those messages were were very difficult, and some of those messages changed your life. Maybe you heard the message from a doctor who said it's cancer. Maybe you heard uh, the message from your boss, from your employer, who said to you, man, I'm really sorry, You're, you're not getting that promotion that you really wanted. Maybe you heard uh, the message from your spouse. I don't love you anymore, and I don't even know if I want to be married to you anymore. And as a result of that message, listen to me, your life has changed this past year. But even in the middle of all of your trials, God allows me to remind you of his messages to you that maybe right now you can't even see. In the middle of your trial, in the middle of your pain, there are some other messages that our gracious Heavenly Father wants you to hear. Will you listen? He says to you through Romans chapter 8, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, I am persuaded that neither angels nor rulers nor things that are present or things that are to come nor anything, height, depth, any other created thing, none of that will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's message to you is also found in Proverbs chapter 3 when he says to you, even in the midst of your trial and your pain, trust in me. He says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding, which is what most of us traditionally do. We are trying to figure it out. God says, no. But instead, I want all of your ways to know me, to acknowledge me. And when you do that, then your paths will be straight. Some of you even today would say this, but Kent, you really don't understand the depth of my situation, which is very possible. You might say, Kent, my situation is so messed up, so jacked up that that not only is it bad for me, but other people are saying bad things about me. People are insulting me. I feel very much as if I'm being persecuted. And listen to me, Jesus says to you, even then, here's the message. He says, Jesus says, Matthew 5, 12, even in that, be glad and rejoice because we're going to look a little bit down the road. Great is your reward in heaven. We, uh, I think we're all, uh, we have experiences as children that impact us, right? 
things that we hold on to that we, we take with us throughout our entire life. And um, you, you guys know some of my testimony, not all of it. But um, my mom and dad were very involved in the church. My, my dad was a, a music minister. My mom was the church pianist. And so we were, we were so active. I, I, great church, great people around me. And uh, one block away from our church there in Oklahoma City was a place called the Grace Rescue Mission. And it was a homeless shelter for men. And because we were so close, our church partnered with them all the time. But, you know, as a kid who was like second or third grade, I, I knew what it was, but I'd never been there. The only thing I knew about it was every Sunday after church, if, if mom and dad had a little bit of extra money, we would go out to eat lunch at Cattleman's Cafe down there in Stockyard City, back in town, Oklahoma City. And, uh, man, if there was only a stockyards in, in Smyrna, Tennessee, we would all be going there today. All I knew was that every Sunday after church was over, we'd get in the car and we would drive by the Grace Rescue Mission. And oftentimes on Sunday morning, I'd look out and, you know, there was a couple of benches out in front of the building and, and just like some homeless guys just sitting out there if the weather was good. And as a, you know, as a third grader, I'm like, I didn't know what to make of that. And so evidently my mom and dad decided that um, they, they would help out. And they said, Kent, here's the deal. We're going to go help lead one of the evening chapel services. And this was like two days before Christmas. Kent, we think you're old enough to go with us. You know, I'm like, what you talking about, Willis? No, I, I, didn't, I don't want to do that. I, I, all I'm thinking about is Santa Claus... I'm thinking about Santa Claus and cookies and candy and all the things a third grader thinks about. And I'm like, really? Mom and dad, you're going to have me go to the homeless shelter two days before Christmas? I, and so, isn't it amazing what you remember? I remember that night as we arrived, feeling very out of place. Uh, the room, their little chapel room, probably about 60 guys in the room that night. And, and uh, I remember when I walked in, that place smelled very different than what I, what I was expecting. It didn't smell real good. Not a real pretty place, kind of dirty. Not a place you would want to really hang out. And so that night, as, as we go into the room to have the chapel service, I'm sitting there. They had some old pews. It looked like you know, some church was getting rid of their pews, so they donated them to the rescue mission. And, and I'm sitting there on the front row. My mom goes over to the piano, you know. And my dad, with all of his music minister style, starts to lead these men to sing some Christmas carols. And I'm, I didn't think they were going to sing. Brother, man, these guys were bringing it. And so here I am, a third grader. I'm like, hold on a minute. Here's a group of guys who are homeless, and they look pretty ragged, and they don't smell very good. But on the heels of Christmas, they are embracing the reality of God speaking to them. And so on that night, that I will never remember the rest of my entire life, God spoke to me, and God absolutely spoke to those men, revealing himself to all of us. No matter if we found ourselves some spoiled little kid living in the suburbs or a homeless man not knowing what tomorrow holds, God speaks. And he spoke to us that day just as he speaks to you today. And he invites you to surrender everything to him and to lay down all of the junk and all of the distractions that we often consider really important to focus on not only this beautiful message of Christmas, but the fact that it is a miracle. It's a miracle. And so I think for every pastor in every church who, who preaches a Christmas sermon series, their heart's desire, my heart's desire is that something would snap inside of you, that you would embrace the miracle of Christmas more so with the people around you than you ever have in your entire life. 
But in order for that to happen, you have to be willing to be silent and still before the Lord to let him speak. You have to be willing to open your Bible and let him speak. You have to be willing to shake it up a little bit. Maybe you go to the homeless shelter and just sit in on that chapel service and see if God speaks. He will. I want to ask you today, are you listening to the Lord? Not me, are you listening to God? Because the Bible says that it is God who draws every man and woman to himself. And for some of you even now, he's drawing you to himself. Last week we talked about, man, you know, I feel like maybe the message was that God was tapping you on the shoulder and just reminding you it's time. It's still time. It's still time for you to follow Christ, for you to embrace the miracle of Christmas. And I'm inviting you to respond to him today. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this morning. In uh, in just a a minute or two, we're going to celebrate some baptisms, individuals whose lives have been changed by the miracle of Christmas. There are others, even in this room now, who, who they're next. They're next. They know it's time, and, and God, I pray that you would continue to let us celebrate with other brothers and sisters in Christ who are obediently following you. God, for some in this room right now, uh, the next step is simply to, to stop. And to listen, to listen to you speak, to listen to your invitation that you invite us to come to you with childlike faith, to follow you, to repent of our sin and to believe. God, you're at work. We don't want to be in your way. We want to see you accomplish what you desire to accomplish so that the world might know of the goodness of our Savior. God, we're going to sing now, and our heart's desire is that these words in this song would bring honor and glory to you. Whether we are the greatest vocalist in this room or whether we cannot sing at all, that doesn't matter. Today, we, are, we want to express our love to you through worship. So may you be honored in this moment. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.